you that are seeing this video in retrospect, this is some stuff at the very beginning where I have to make sure everything works properly and everything's going smoothly on the stream, so. Just give me a second on that, and I'm gonna see this work video. There we go. Cool. We're playing on YouTube, so I'll make sure. Those of you that watch this after the fact, in case I use this one, because I'm choosing between using this one and. I'm gonna turn the music a little bit down. There we go. Uh, if you're watching this after the fact, I'm either gonna use this one or I'm gonna use seven periods for my. Uh, like keeping it on my YouTube channel, because I'm making three of these today. Uh, but yeah, this is where I'm gonna go through the fundamentals of econ. It's one of my, like, probably my first like actual content PowerPoint that we've got for the course. It is a lecture that pr focuses primarily on stuff like uh, factors of production, the circular flow model, and opportunity costs. Some introductory stuff, fairly basic material. Though there are a couple things that students do tend to struggle with, namely the circular flow model, as well as certain limitations of opportunity cost, things like that. I showed students starting to make their way into this around um, 1.30, which is 1.29 now. So you should be getting here any moment. Got four watching now, cool. I'm gonna keep refreshing, making sure everything's working on my side. Uh, students, as you start to make your way into it, just say what's up, say hi in the chat so I know that you're here. Because unlike Zoom, it's harder for me to see uh, who is and isn't here without someone just mentioning it. There is also a 30 second delay, students, between my audio uh, and between the video stream and you guys chatting. It's not live. Well, it's live, but it's 30 second delay. So if it seems like it's taking a while to respond to you, that is that is what's happened. It is taking a while. It is how it works. Probably wait until I have, oh, I got 11 people now. Great. You guys are doing awesome. People are just flying in already. Yeah, 11. Okay, cool. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm going to throw up. The GIF is obviously how Zoom is feeling today and how a lot of schools around the country are feeling today because we all kind of rely on Zoom and Zoom went down. It's still kind of down. It's working better for me, but because I can't guarantee that it's working for all of you, I'm just going to do this because I know you all can see this because it's YouTube and YouTube doesn't really crash. So I'm going to use this service for today. If Zoom's back to normal, you know, by this afternoon, then tomorrow we'll run like normal using Zooms and everything. But just know that I have a backup plan. This is my backup plan of if I can't get class to work. I might not do like three of these a day if or four of these a day if I have to, but I will if we need to. Uh, whenever, if Zoom ever crashes or has pr proves to be a not effective system. So I'm going to leave this open for a little bit let people start to make in. students again as you show up just start you know say hi in the chat and say what's up let me know that you're here so that I can actually like be aware of who's here I see 13 viewers but I don't see who those people are you can also see Archer in the background lying down on the couch out of focus because my camera is good I'm trying to think of anything else uh... Yeah, today's lesson, in case you missed it, will be Fundamentals of Economics. This is going to be very basic introductory stuff. It's pretty much all notes today. It won't take a long... Uh, I say it won't take a long time. The first one took about an hour, so it'll probably take around an hour to do this whole... And this is the whole lesson. Hey, guys. Murphy Mona, good to see you guys. Yeah, this will this is, this will be about an hour, but it'll cover everything, including the, like, work time stuff, so... Sydney, good to see you. Good to have everybody here. Trying to think of what else. Uh, Stephanie, good to see you guys. Uh, also, thank you for all the emails today. <laughs> Email is again slow like it was last week on Thursday and Friday. Uh, I'll pause the music now. Uh, yeah, the email is slow again like it was last week. So if I did not get to your email immediately, uh, I probably did get to it immediately. It just didn't send back because I didn't get a lot of your emails, I think, until probably a good 30 to 45 minutes after you sent it. Hey, guys. Hey, Garrett. Hey, Lily. Hey, Sydney. What's up, everybody? Feel free to post questions in the chat too. Like if you got questions over stuff, throw them in there. What's going on? Why YouTube? What is? How do you have a GIF on here? All that stuff. Feel free to ask. It's fine. Uh, I'll get started here. Probably give people a few more minutes. Let's say at one thirty-seven my time. It's thirty-three right now. So if you need to go grab a drink, use the restroom real quick. Go for it. Grab a small snack. Jackson, good to see you. 
Jackson, we're figuring it out every day, buddy. <laughs> we're making things happen, man. Uh, we used Snapchat on Thursday, and now we're using just YouTube on Friday. Oh, Monday. At some point, fifth period will have a normal Zoom class where everything goes smoothly. You guys are just caught in like the worst time period of the day when the email traffic is the worst. So, and Zoom is still iffy. Nate, Ian, Jordan, good to see you, everybody. Uh, while we are, Anna, good to see you. While we're passing time, because I'm just going to hold this until 137, let's talk about stuff that's happening right now. Luka Doncic, guys? Um, hello? I would be probably starting off every class period with just like that clip looped like 35 times. And I'm not even a Mavs fan. I'm a Lakers fan, but that was awesome. <laughs> that was great. For those of you that don't know, Luka Doncic is a player on the Mavericks and hit a game-winning shot last night against the Clippers in a playoff game in overtime to win it at the buzzer. So, it was awesome. Crazy cool sports are awesome. Liliana, what's up? Thank you. Thanks for the diversity as opposed to all of the highs. Yeah, Luka. Luka was wild. Gerp, if you would mind typing your actual student name. <laughs> Or using your NISD email, as, or NISD Google account is also going to work for that. People tend to not realize that they're, you know, just using their normal YouTube, normal Google account. I respect it, though. It's fun. At least it's not, like, inappropriate or anything, I think. hope it's not slang or anything. But, yeah, this was the format that I used to do class last year. Um, last year, you know, we didn't have the Zoom protocols or anything like that, and attendance was not a thing that we were really tracking. So I just did, you know, Grant. Perfect. Thanks, Grant. Um, where we were just doing, like, I was doing live streams for my classes most days. Uh, so, yeah. No, you're fine. No worries, Grant. Uh, but, yeah, this was, like, my way of getting around Zoom because I did not trust Zoom as a platform. Um, Parts because the security stuff that's come out about Zoom because it's, like, a you know, Chinese company. There's data mining and everything. Mostly because it just hadn't been that high traffic. So I didn't trust that it would be able to handle it. And as is being proven today, I guess, um, I might have been right. Um, so here's the heads up for all of you guys. We're at 136 now, 20 people in the chat. Awesome. Good to see There's a lot of people. You guys are turning out the majority of the classes here. Um, in case of emergency, that emergency being primarily, if only, Zoom not working. This is our backup. Uh, this is my backup plan because I can do this. Thankfully, I, at home, if I'm at home, I have a streaming setup. I have all this interface stuff working. Like, you know, this stupid dumb GIF I can play. I can delete it. I can hide it. I can have uh, that song of the day with my Spotify linked up. I have all this stuff set up from last year. So, if Zoom is not working, the good news is I still got you guys. I can still handle it. Thank God. And figure and we can figure it out. Um, but you know. If Zoom is working properly, and if email is working properly, you should get the links to everything and be able to use everything, and we can do a normal class at some point. But yeah, that'll be just fine. Uh, try and keep the chat, um, say professional, but just sort of like use it as if we were going to use it in a Zoom call. So you got questions, throw them in there. You got comments and concerns, throw them in there. Uh, you want to talk to your friend, Garrett and Gurf, you guys are fine, but just text each other or something. So yeah, if you're here and you haven't said hi yet, just say what's up in the chat so I know that you're all here. That makes that makes things easier for me in terms of if they wanted to make me take attendance, I could just refer to this. I mean, like, cool, these kids are all here. Um, I don't think I need to for it, but you're good. And Gio was doing the work earlier because he emailed me about, some, he had some questions about the assignments, so I know he was working about it. He was working on the stuff for the class. He might have just been like, I'm not going to do the YouTube because I'm doing all the work already, which is fine. This is just, people tend to learn better in this class by listening to somebody explain it. So I will prop, so this is probably the best way to do it. Okay, uh, we're at 138 now, so let's just get things started. Um, good afternoon class, good to have you here. Yeah, this is my backup plan for if Zoom doesn't work. Luckily I've got one. Uh, hopefully you got everything from my couple of emails. You at least got the most recent one where you got my link to this YouTube channel, that's good. Um, but if things were working, like if you tried to do the AP Classroom thing already and you weren't able to because of the lockdown browser stuff, I fixed that now. Everything like that is taken care of. 
I think troubleshooted basically the first couple class periods, but I think we've got everything is now in order. Everything should be available on my Moodle page that you need. Everything else seems to be working fine. The AP Classroom stuff is now sorted, fixed all of that. So I think we're okay. I think we're good, but you know, we're all in like, you know, uncharted waters when it comes to doing all this remote stuff. And thankfully I'm pretty tech savvy, so I can figure most of it out. But if I don't, if you got a problem, email me, it's fine. Email is being slow again today, so be patient with your teachers of like, I emailed them like 20 minutes ago and they haven't responded. It's like, yeah, I didn't get a lot of your guys' emails till 45 minutes after the fact again. So be aware of that. Like I'm trying to be proactive with my emails, but it's really hard to maintain communication in this uh, window. So, careful about all that stuff. But outside of that, I think we can do this. It worked well for third period. We were able to get through the entire lesson in a little less than an hour. So we'll try and do that again this time. If you have questions, again, speak up in the chat. This is a big note-taking day in terms of, I know we promised lots of fun activities, but I do have to cover some stuff that I don't want to make you read a textbook over because I hate making people read textbooks. So let me get everything set up on my end. I think we're good. Do we have any questions before class starts? Katie, good to see you. Jack, good to see you. Sydney, good to see you. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for thanks for speaking out. Makes it easier for me. Just Again, that's just in case I have to take attendance with it. I don't think I will, but, you know, better be safe than sorry. So let me, here we go. Let me shrink that real quick. Bang. All right. Hmm. Let me trim this really quickly okay that's a little better it's weird but it's better all right so here's our bell ringer trivia just like last time i mentioned that i was going to do these on moodle under daily attendance checks uh again i don't know if they're going to make us take attendance today that way but if they are hey on my moodle under daily attendance checks there is this you should be able to write type in responses to these two questions I don't want you to look any of this up. I don't want you to Google it. I just want guesses. I'm not gonna like out people like, oh my God, this person, but New York City. And it's like, okay, no, I'm not gonna do that to anybody. So put whatever you think the answers are in that Moodle chat. The questions are, which country exports the most oil to the United States? Being where do we in the United States get most of our oil from? Not counting here. You can type it in the chat too. That's fine, Murph, that's allowed. It's just make sure that you answer it on Moodle so that you get used to doing that because that's the game plan for attendance. And then what is the world's largest restaurant chain? Okay, we've got Russia, we've got Canada. These are good guesses. These are big oil producing countries, by the way. You guys have both nailed two big oil, oil, oil producers. So which country exports the most oil? Which is the world's largest restaurant chain? Again, I'm, and this is not fast food, so you can't use like McDonald's. You can't use... Um, Pizza Hut, Starbucks, any of those. It has to be a chain restaurant that has like a waiter and menu and all that stuff. Okay, we've got another guest for Canada, Sydney. Okay. I'll get to the answer in a bit, but I want to give you guys a minute or so so you can go on to Moodle and type them in there. Because I do want you all to get used to doing that. Moodle has been better today than it was last week. It is still having some issues, but it's not going crazy. Grant, you're having an issue with Moodle right now? That's fine. If Moodle isn't working for you, that's fine. Just type your answers into the chat. It's been working intermittently for me today. Like, it might, sometimes it says it times out, and then I just refresh it, and that works just fine. Sometimes it doesn't. So, if it's not working for you right now, ain't the end of the world to me. But just, if you can, if it's working, try it out. Like, Grant, I can, I can see that you are here. Liana, you can't get in. Sealand. Jack. Okay. And he says Olive Garden for the second one. Yeah. I can check your answers on Moodle right now and just see how we're doing on that, and then I will answer these. Do, 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 do. Again, this is just random knowledge. If you don't know, I don't expect people to know the answers to these. If you don't, it's cool. A lot of you guys are making what I would consider to be pretty good educated guesses. We're doing all right so far. Uh, this is third, fifth, seventh. Oh yeah, Moodle is being slow as crazy right now. I see Chili's, I see Iran and Iraq as countries where we get our oil from. Um, Chili's is a good guess. You guys fighting about it. All right, 
We don't. We. I will tell you. We have not said the restaurant yet. The country has been said. Somewhere in the Middle East. Okay. That is an educated guess, Garrett. I would count that as an educated guess. It's easier if you put me if you put an actual country down, but we can deal with that. All right, so let's go through these. Here's the answers. We did have people get the country that exports the most oil to the United States. That one is taken care of and has been addressed. It's Canada. Okay, we get more of our oil from Canada than we do from any country in the Middle East, which is, people don't realize that. Uh, one, it's because a lot of the, you know, political conflict over there has been a lot of the times said, I hope would count, Stephen, as an answer. Um, a lot of the conflict over there has been said to be mostly driven by oil, which is not incorrect, but that's not where we get the most oil from, okay? Most of our oil is from Canada. That's our number one trade partner. And people underestimate them all the time when it comes to kind of anything. One, they're a massive economy. Two, we trade with them more than anybody else, more than China, more than the Middle East, more than Europe. It's Canada, because they're right there. Convenience trumps everything, okay? They are right there. They have a lot of similar tastes as we do. They like a lot of the same stuff as we do. We like a lot of the same stuff as them, so we trade with them all the time, okay? Very frequent trade partner with Canada. The border there is fairly lax in terms of stress. Stress there isn't like a lot. There isn't like a commotion at the border there like there is in Mexico with Mexico. So yeah, we trade with them constantly. So yeah, they're the one we get the most oil from. So people tend not to realize that. We had people guess that already at the top though. So good job, to people who guessed Canada. World's largest restaurant chain. No one has said it. It's Applebee's, guys. I know that's not exciting. That's discouraging. It probably makes you feel really bad as an American. I'm like that's what we're doing. That's what people get from us. They get Applebee's. Ugh. Yeah, it's Applebee's, guys. Um, Applebee's has over 6,000 locations globally. Largest restaurant chain in the world. So if you're wondering why people don't like America that much, maybe it's that. It could be that. It could be that we're just feeding them Applebee's. And the second largest restaurant chain uh, in the world is TGI Fridays. So we're just sending people food that no American wants to eat. <laughs> oh, Lily said it? Oh, Lily did. You did, you did say it, Lily. Sorry, my bad. I didn't see Applebee. I didn't see it. Lily said Canada and Applebee's. Lily got both. Never mind. Sorry about that, Lily. You're good. You got it. Yeah, it's Applebee's. It's not great. If you go outside of the United States, you might notice this, because if you go outside of the country and go to, like, airports or go to malls in other countries, you might notice a lot more Applebee's, TGI Fridays, and Fuddruckers than you would ever guess to see in other countries. In other countries, you're like, what? They have this? Why do they have this? Remember, guys, there's a delay in between me seeing the chat and me saying stuff on the screen. So if there's like confusion of like, oh my god, he's not addressing something in the chat. It's like, yeah, I, uh... Oh, Lily might have already taken the notes. <laughs> nice. She took the notes. That's, oh, hey, she's allowed to take notes. Hey, you're allowed to take notes, guys. Especially since I sent that out before I sent out that I was going to do this on a live stream. That's smart. Okay, so those are our two bell ringer answers. All right. But good job, guys. Don't get mad at Lou for being better than you. That's not on her. You guys got to check that stuff, too. Let me adjust this a little bit, sorry. I have to cut off the camera, but, like... Kind of hate just having like the yearbook picture portrait of me in the corner. So I'm gonna make this a little bit wider. And that's better. Okay, so notes for today fundamentals of economics. A lot of this is gonna feel like very, very basic stuff. So if I say something and you're like, Mikurchi, I know that. Cool, don't write it. Like, I have things highlighted in this PowerPoint that are things that people will forget. Okay. There are things that, he, that I know people forget or that they mistake all the time. It happens a lot. I've taught this class for five years now. Trust me, I know. Yes, I know that you're smart. I get that. I have people who are like top five in class rank, forget what this word means because they're just like, I know what this word means, and then they forget it. Okay. So sometimes in econ, we have very specific definitions for things. So if I've highlighted something, trust me, you want to write that down. Well, don't want to. You should write that down. Cool? Cool. Uh, if you have questions while I'm talking, type them in the chat. Again, I won't see them the moment you type them. I'll see them about a minute after the fact, but I'll see it and I'll try to respond to it. Okay. 
So here's some examples of things that you probably don't need to write down. Price versus cost. This is what price is, this is what cost is. Now, important to mention that these two words don't mean the same thing in economics, okay? They mean two very different things. One is how much a consumer pays, the other one is the producer's payment for that good. That is important, that is an important distinction because if you see the word, the cost of a good goes up, it does not mean that, it make, that I pay more for that good. It means that the business has to pay more to make it. it. means it's a problem for them that will probably eventually become a problem for me, but it is a problem for them. So be wary of that. If you just want to write price, consumer, cost, producer, cool, good, move on. This, this word. <sighs> breathe, Nickerchi, breathe. This definition people miss up all the time. They never want to write it down. They're like, I know what investment is. I like stocks. And then they're wrong every time. So it's highlighted because write it. <laughs> Swear. People never want to write this. Investment is the money spent by businesses to improve their production. It is specifically just that in economics, in this class. In the real world, yes, it can mean like a 401k or stock markets or in real estate or a bunch of things. Yeah, that's true, sure. In this class, it means money spent by businesses to improve their production. That can be on a lot of stuff. That could be businesses hiring workers. That's investment spending. Could be business buying a factory. That's investment spending. Could be business uh, acquiring a bunch of software to help their tech work more smoothly. That's investment spending. It's spending specifically by businesses to improve their production. This is most of what businesses spend their money on. Okay, most versions of business spending is investment. It's an investment in their ability to produce. So when you see the word investment in econ, know that it's tied to business spending. If it sounds like I was being repetitive there, it's because people need it repeated. If you're like, I get it, great, write it down and never forget it. And I won't ever have to embarrass you about it. I do know that I talk very fast. That's why there are words on the screen. Yeah, that's an example of investment spending. It ain't crazy. Once you get it, you're like, okay, that's not hard. It's not hard. Just people just tend to forget it or want to think it's the other thing. Okay, goods and services. Again, you probably don't need to write that, yeah, that first thing. Ignore that. That's what a good is. Cool. There are two different types of goods. The second one people need to know more than the first. Consumer goods are goods that are used up. Think food. Like you make the thing and then it's gone. When it's used, it no longer exists. It doesn't have repeated use. It doesn't have utility. It is just there and then no longer there. That is a consumer good. It's a good made for consumption. Oil would also be a consumer good, in case you're wondering. Okay. A capital good is a good used for indirect consumption, something used to make something else. Uh, this is mostly technology. Most technology is a capital good. It is not like I use my phone to make a call and the phone explodes, right? The phone keeps existing. I get to keep using it again and again and again and again and again. I can use it for a bunch of different things. That is indirect consumption. Things that have repeated use, that don't just go away when you use them once, those are our capital goods. And those tend to be more important. Countries that favor the production of capital goods tend to have more long-term growth. Why? Because they're building tech. And when you build more tech, you can use that tech to build more of everything else, right? Think of industrialization and how those countries accelerated their growth compared to countries that weren't industrialized as quickly. That's a good example of it. Services, yeah, I mean, you probably know what that is. The big thing here in terms of real world takeaway is to understand that a huge transition point in American history from an economic standpoint is when we transitioned from a goods-based economy to a service-based economy. That means is that the driving force of our production is no longer in the making of physical stuff, right? Manufacturing does not drive our economy anymore. It is service industries, things that we do for other people. Think of most of the jobs you guys are going for when you're getting a college degree. Most college diplomas aren't so that you can go build a car. It's so that you can manage, that's a service. It's so that you can teach, like me, that's a service. You can be a doctor, that's a service, not a good. Okay, so we are a service-based economy now, which in terms of why that matters, it helps explain what happens to some cities, right? Um, Detroit is a great example of it because Detroit was one of the largest cities in America, one of the most powerful and economically the most productive cities in America for a good 40 years 
Why? Because we were a goods-based economy and they were producing our number one seller, cars. They were a city built around the automotive industry and the moment we pivot, the moment we stop being goods-based become, because it becomes more profitable for us to be service-based, their entire economy as a city tanks. Those factories start closing down, people start losing their jobs because they were built around that specific thing. Okay, if we pivot back from service to goods, a lot of college diplomas are going to become super useless, which is a bad thing for most of us because that's an investment of a lot. Investment is a tricky word right there. That's a lot of our money that becomes not really useful. So that's why it matters knowing what, if we're goods or services. China, goods-based economy. They make stuff. We're service-based. Okay. So there's some very basic things to start off with, right? You're like, oh, cool, econ's easy, I'll get 100 on this class, I'll never fail the AP exam. Yeah, that's not that's not what the AP exam's about. That's just stuff you need to know so that you can do everything. First thing, factors of production. <sighs> this, I, this is why I don't have you guys read textbooks, because econ, more than a lot of classes I find, has this nasty habit of um, making up fancy words to mean things that are super, super simple. Brendan, you're fine, no worries, dude. You'll, this video will be on YouTube later if you want to watch the first 15 minutes of it. You're good. I don't think they're taking Tardy's grant. So, factors of production. These are resources. Factors of production, synonym, resources. You can just write factors of production equal resources. But specifically, the factors of production are a way of categorizing the resources. Okay, It's a way of taking everything we use to make something and putting it into one of four boxes. Okay, so there are four specific categories you have to know. These are just how we categorize resources. You need to make something, you gotta use something to make something. These are just what we use. The four factors of production are, and you do wanna write these even though it's not highlighted because like, come on. Land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, which I guess looks like me this time, but that's what the picture is about. It's not me. but. Land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. These are our four categories of all resources used to make something probably fall under one of these four. And I'll get to what each of these encapsulates. Some of them are self-explanatory, which you'd think land is. It's kind of not. Labor is what you think it is. People working for money, that's labor. You got it. Entrepreneurship, the long word that's spelled weird and feels weird to spell because you're like, oh, there's so many E's, so many vowels and R's. Yeah. Whatever, to write the word, it's fine. These are our four factors of production. I'm gonna to go to the next slide, but don't worry, each of the slides is like me going through in detail each of these, okay? Oh, one more thing. In addition to the factors of production, there is a vocab term that doesn't really show up all the time, but just in case it does, is called factor payments. And that is, whenever you pay for one of these, you use a factor payment. And there's a specific term for it, like when you pay for land, it's called rent. Oh, you got to be like, oh, yeah. Okay. When you pay for labor, that's wages. And you're like, oh, yes, wages. I Okay. So there are those for each of these, and I'll show you them as we go along. But those are called factor payments. It's just when you pay for these resources, you're paying this term. It's the name for the term. Okay, land. Let me just let these things show up. Land is natural resources. However, you got to be very careful. It's not just land, though. It's anything that would occur naturally without us being there. Things that we don't need to be around for in order to exist. So, and bear with me when I say this, because people hate when I say this. Water is land. Sunlight is land. Wind is land. Okay. Those are all land. Okay. Animals are land. Because, like, a cow would be there, even if I wasn't, right? Even if human, humanity didn't exist, there would still be, like, cows and stuff. So, anything that would be there without us being there is land. Whenever you take one of those natural resources and sell them to somebody, the money you get for it is called rent. Colloquially, because you don't really ever own the land, like, you're going to die at some point, so, like, it'll, and it'll still be there without you. So, you're just really renting it. It's like a big Pocahontas kind of idea to it. Okay. <laughs> I 
All right, labor. This one's simple. You get paid for a job, that's labor. You do work, get paid for it, labor. Boom. It's the actual effort you do is the labor. The work you do is the labor. Okay, and the money made off of labor is called wages. That's where most of our income comes from. That shouldn't be crazy. That, that one is what you think it is. Like labor, I know what that is. Just know that wages is what we call when you pay, get paid for labor. Technically, this does mean that slavery does not count, which it doesn't because you're not paying for it. You're effectively cheating economics because you're not paying for the use of a resource. Typically, there's like 35 other ethical problems with it rather than, but it's not called labor? It's like, yeah, it's also like a human rights violation and terrible. There's a lot of things wrong with it. <laughs> Next one. Capital. This one is the most important. Siren. Sirens going crazy. This is the most important one. Okay. Capital. Like capital goods. Capital is any asset that you can use to improve your productivity. It's something that helps you produce more stuff. Okay. In general, that will lead to things like tools and technology, but also workers' knowledge and skills. Okay. Because assets are things that can be changed, they can be improved upon. So there are two categories, two types of capital you've got to know. One is physical capital. These are actual tangible things that exist. They are tools, technology, factories, buildings, parts of buildings, like a kitchen would be capital. Also, any human-made thing that is used to help facilitate the creation of other goods and services, whether it's the actual making of it, like a automated machine that helps you produce cars, or it's the location that is used to house that. Having the factory indoors of a building is helpful compared to having it out in the wild. You don't go like walking through the forest and then you open up and there's effectively a factory, but no walls, just like a bunch of car manufacturing things out in the middle of the woods. That'd be terrible and useless. So the building itself is also physical capital because it helps facilitate that. The other type of capital is human capital, your knowledge or skills. Now this is tricky, people tend to like be like, isn't this labor? No, labor is the actual work you do slash the number of people doing the work. Human capital are those people's knowledge and skills. Because that can be driven in a different way than number of people is, right? Things that change the number of people won't necessarily change how smart they are. Those are different variables. So how skilled you are in your labor, how much stuff you have, you know that you can help with, that is human capital. This is the most important one. This is the one that can typically most easily be changed, right? A lot of these, a lot of this changes naturally over time in ways that are usually advantageous. Technology has a tendency to get better over time. People have a tendency to get smarter over time. So this is one that kind of naturally improves, which helps explain why productivity is usually greater and greater and greater every single year in America. We project about two to 3% economic growth every single year. This is part of the reason because capital drives a lot of it. The money made off of capital, like if you sell capital, is called interest. Different than the interest that you earn on like a bank or something. It's different than that. I love econ vocabulary. Sometimes they make up new words, sometimes they just use the same word 45 different times and hope you figure out which one it is. I don't make the rules, guys. It would make more sense if I did. Questions, comments, concerns, we all doing okay. I'll check for questions in a bit. Last one, last factor of production, entrepreneurship. Speaking of the maps, there's Mark Cuban. Best definition I've found, the ability to innovate and discover new ways of utilizing resources. This is different from labor because labor is simply the work you are doing. This is finding new ways to do things and then being able to capitalize on it. This is meant to be like a, I don't think this fits anywhere else category. So they made up this category. Examples of this were Henry Ford and creating the mass production engine, Bill Gates with most software technology. Generally, inventors and store owners almost always have some level of entrepreneurship that are, that are displayed. Shark Tank usually showcases a lot of entrepreneurship. Their big deal, their big goal is that they're the ones who start off with the idea, innovate and change how things are being done, and then if things go wrong, they get the blame. If things go great, they get all the glory. It's kind of like the quarterback of the football team thing, where 
If you win, everybody loves you. If you lose, everybody hates you. That's all your fault, even if your defense is garbage. And the money they make, or the money made off of the sale of, tricky to phrase it, entrepreneurship is profit. Again, a different profit than the one you're thinking of, usually. So, to recap. Four factors of production. Land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. I know. Short, short, medium, crazy long. I got it. The factor payments, the when you pay for these things, for land, it's rent. For labor, it's wages. For capital, it's interest. For entrepreneurship, it's profit. I think land, rent, labor, wages, those ones are pretty easy. Entrepreneurs are the ones seeking the profit. Capital is driven by interest. Tends to be the easiest way to think about it. Okay, so I'm not gonna make you do this because this, be, this is something that's much better when we're together and in a forum where I can like call on you and stuff. This is not conducive to that. So I'm not gonna put that pressure on you here. Let me move my head and cut myself in half for a second. So here is a couple paragraphs detailing sort of the, let me over here, there we go. Day-to-day -day operations of a pizza place. You call to order a pizza, you pick up the phone and give your order to the owner who made the decision to their computer, comes up on the monitor in the kitchen, blah, 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 blah. What I'm gonna show you is if I go through and mark each of the factors of production, that's what happens. Which is why this, they're so important. It's because you don't think about it, but so much of every single step of you doing a thing in a business is interacting with a resource. You pick up the telephone. Okay, well that store has a telephone. Stores don't come with telephones like built in. You have to pay for that, right? So that's a resource, it's capital. You give your order to the owner. Cool, the owner of one gets paid and two is probably an entrepreneur. So there's a factor of production right there that enters it doing any action as a laborer, that's labor, into their computer, that's also capital. Comes up on the chief baker, labor, monitor, capital, in the kitchen, capital. So that is one of their cooks, labor. The cook was busy mixing dough. Mixing, that's labor, gets paid for that. Out of salt, flour, eggs, and milk. Technically speaking, those would exist without us. Flour is tricky, but they would technically exist without us. So those are land. I know. Eggs are land. Hate it. The cook, the cook finished mixing dough, washed his hands. That's labor and also really helpful. In the sink, capital, prepared to pizza, labor. Tomato sauce, cheese, and sausage. Now, technically, none of those are made without us. I still classify those as land but no one would get mad at you if you wanted to label those as capital. Because I know tomato sauce doesn't like magically appear on a tree and cheese doesn't just magically appear and sausage definitely doesn't magically appear. Like, those are things that do need humans to exist, but it still comes from the land. I'm still gonna call it land. They, they wouldn't care on that. It can, things can be more than one thing. You then place the pizza in the oven. That is, well, placing the pizza, labor, oven, capital, Cardboard box, capital. Delivered person, labor. Company car, capital. Delivered, labor. That's a ton, right? And the reason why this matters, if you're like, okay, cool, there's lots of, lots of things here. If the price of any of those things that are underlined is changed, the bottom line of the business is changed, right? If this phone costs more to use, then it's gonna cost more for the business to do their stuff. If the kitchen costs more to maintain, it's gonna cost more for the business to do things. And what happens if it costs more for business to do something? What do they have to do? Charge people more, right? If all of these things are variables, and as variables, when they change, other stuff gets affected. And in this case, any of these resources being affected negatively will make the price go up. Any of them being affected positively, if any of these things gets easier or cheaper, the price can go down to the good. That's the point of focusing on resources like that. Keep an eye on resources. Cool. Thank you. All right, factors of production done. What time is it? Two oh eight. When do we get out of here? Three. Okay, we're doing we're doing okay on time. This might take a little longer, but only because I spent some time getting everyone started. So if you only end up with like fifteen minutes in between this and your next class, I apologize. But part of that is just getting everything set up and operational, and giving people time to show up. So apologies on that. Okay, circular flow model. This disclaimer, if you are someone who is currently playing the NBA 2K21 demo right now, 
or is playing Fall Guys, or is watching a YouTube tutorial on how to make Eggs Benedict, pause what you are doing, watch this part. This is the part out of this lecture that people tend to mess up the most on tests and quizzes. So focus on this, okay? This is when we're going to want to focus, and when we show the model, you need to draw it. You need to draw it in your journal, you need to make it yourself somewhere so that you have something to refer back to. People struggle with this a lot. Personally, I don't really get why they struggle with it, so I'm going to emphasize every part of it clearly, concisely, and repeatedly to make sure you get it. Cool? And if you don't get what I'm saying, ask questions. Use the chat. Please, please, please use that chat bar right there and ask me questions about it. Cool. All right. Circular flow model. First things first, we use models a lot. We use models and graphs all the time in this class. You're going to see them all the time. You can get really annoyed with them because it's like, oh, God, another one. And you have to memorize it, kind of. You have to know what it's about. And what's in blue is what's this one about? The circular flow model is a model that demonstrates four things. Well, it's really two and two. It shows how two groups, households and firms, households being consumers, firms being businesses, how those two groups interact in two markets. Those two markets are the product market, which is the market for goods, you know, just basic things you buy, and the factor market, which is the market for resources or factors of production. Okay, so it's how two entities, households and firms, interact in two markets, product market, factor market. A market, in case you don't know, is a place, doesn't have to be physical, it can be like theoretical, it doesn't have to physically exist where buyers and sellers meet. So this is just where do buyers and sellers of goods interact and where do buyers and sellers of resources interact. The big things to be focusing on when I show you the model are who are the buyers and sellers in each market? Who buys, who sells products? Who buys, who sells resources? You should be able to figure out the product market on your own. You shouldn't need me for that. The factor market people tend to struggle with. Okay, I'm going to show the model here in a sec. I'm going to move my face out of the way again. This. Copy this thing. All of it. All of that. Copy it. Copy that whole thing. The words too. I know. It's a lot. I'm giving you time here. I'm going to wait. I'm going to pause. I'm going to breathe. I'll let you copy this. You need to have this in your notes somewhere. Because I'm going to reference it and you're going to be like, yeah, sure. How does that go again? And not be able to picture it. And you're going to be like, oh, I didn't draw it anywhere. Oh, boy. I hope I don't fail the test because of it. Again, this is going to be the most missed questions on my first test every year are about this thing. So definitely draw it. There's four big things. The factor market up top, the product market down below, households on the right, businesses or firms. You can write either. The words get used interchangeably on the left. If you haven't used the word firms, F-I-R-M-S, ever in your life, I'd probably use it here just so you get used to it. It comes up a lot. As just this word also means businesses. So what you are looking at. What is in yellow is money. It's just different labels for money at different stages of this cycle, effectively. What's in red is, in, in <laughs> simplest terms, stuff. <laughs> we give money, yellow in one direction, for stuff. Red in the other direction. That isn't crazy. I mean, what's, what it's saying down in the bottom right is that households spend consumption. That's consumer money. It's not like uh, the consumption. It's consu consumer spending. We spend money on goods. We put money into the product market. The product market gives us goods. You go to a place, you buy a thing. How do you do that? You give them money. They give you stuff. Not crazy. The businesses receive that money in the form of revenue, it's just the label of the money, in return for those same goods. So we give money to businesses, they give stuff to us. It just happens to take place in the product market, which is where buyers and sellers of products interact. Households are the buyers, businesses are the sellers. That part, easy peasy, no one ever has any problems with it. What, you're telling me we buy stuff from businesses, Mr. McRitchie? Oh, this was an AP class. I know that. I'm a human being. It's like, yes, good, good. 
bottom half isn't the problem. People don't have a trick. That, that part doesn't mess them up. The top half people have a problem with. They refuse to ever try and learn what this means. The factor market is the market for resources. Who needs the resources, guys? Businesses or households, who needs those resources? Businesses do. They're the ones that are making stuff. They need resources to make their stuff. So this part is the opposite of the bottom because instead of households buying from businesses, businesses are buying from households. Let's focus on that. Businesses are giving money to households in return for the use of resources. Think about it. We mentioned the resources just a second ago, the factors of production, land, labor. Oh, that's the big one. Capital, including human capital, entrepreneurship. Oh, a good number of these I have, and I give to businesses in exchange for money. Think about it. Whenever you get a job from any place, you are selling your labor to a business. They pay you a wage. Cool. The same way that you buy something from a business, they are buying your labor from you, your work from you. So these costs, this income goes to households in return for these resources, also known as inputs. When you put something in to make something, that's an input. So it's a resource, just another word for it, which businesses then turn into goods and sell to us. The logic of this, it's all connected, bro. The money we spend on stuff, businesses give right back to us. We're like feeding them the money, man. Yeah, it's that. It's literally just that. We give businesses money. They give us that money right back. They give us money. We give them that money right back. That's the logic of it. But what is also happening is they give us stuff and we give them the resources they need to make that stuff. So it's actually two layers. There's two circles that are in opposite directions. Money on one, stuff on the other. So big things with this to understand from in terms of questions you'll get asked about it. Who are the buyers and sellers in each market? Mention that each market always has buyers and sellers who are who in which market. In the product market, that's easy. We're the buyers because you buy products. Businesses are the sellers. That's what you guys think of every market is businesses selling stuff to me. Cool. That's a product market. But in the factor market, businesses are the ones buying and we're the ones selling because you sell your labor and they're buying from you. Okay, whenever you go to apply for jobs and you're like comparison shopping with how much they're going to pay you, it's the same idea as you going to a store and comparison shopping. Except instead of you buying the job, you're selling yourself for the, for the uh, money. Big brain stuff right there. So again, these are the big questions. These are the ones that catch people. First question that catch people. People tend to overthink this or just try and like confuse themselves on it. Who controls the factors of production? There's two parts of this. One is who owns them initially, and two is who determines how to use them. You gotta understand both of those. Who controls them? Well, it depends on how you wanna phrase it. Can, households are the ones who own them. Households are the initial owners of the factors of production. You own your labor, you sell it to businesses. It starts off with you. But the one who controls how much of it to use is the business, right? They determine how many hours they need you to work. They determine how much of your land they want to buy. They determine how much capital they're going to spend on. So ultimately, who controls it are businesses, okay? Because they're the ones who determine how much of it they want to use. They could want to use none of it. They could say, nope, don't want any of it. And then cool that you have the factor of production, but do you have any control on how it's being used? No, cool, then you don't really control it ultimately. And then I mentioned this before, but this is something I would frankly just write it down underneath it. Who are the buyers and sellers in each market? Okay, in the factor market, again, this is the one that works opposite of how the world normally works in your head. In the factor market, we households are the ones selling. We are the sellers in the factor market. Households sell, businesses buy in the factor market. In the product market, that works the way you think it does. Households buy, businesses sell. Okay. So I would probably write that one down. And this is in the notes tab. For those of you that have not been, uh, that don't look in depth on our PowerPoints and stuff like that, let me show you something real quick. If you look, there's this little tab right here called the notes tab. If you don't know how to see that on a PowerPoint, because maybe you're using Google Slides, or maybe you're using uh, an Apple product, 
If you go to view, this is usually almost always a view button, notes, it'll pop up this little thing. I almost always have usually what I am saying in class in the notes tab so that in case you are absent on a particular day and you want to see what's going on. Let me move my head out of the way there. So you can see everything you need to see. That's also a typo, whatever. That's fine. But that's how you see some stuff in case you don't ever get to see it. So that's pretty useful. People who are generally absent and like miss a PowerPoint like, what did he say? What's the answer? It's in the notes. I got you. All right. Pause. We're almost done. We're close. Really close. Can I say the answers one more time? Yes, I can, Leon. Good question. Who controls the factors of production? Firms. Businesses do because they control what amounts of those to use. They control how much labor they need. They control how much capital they want to buy. It, that's on them. So firms ultimately control the factors of production. That's the first part. Pausing, giving people time to write it. In the who the buyers and sellers in the factor market, the buyers are the businesses, the sellers are the households because we sell our resources to businesses, right? You sell your labor to a business that they then pay you for, right? So you're selling, businesses are buying in the factor market. In the product market, we buy, households buy, businesses sell. That's normal goods and services. That is your how the world typically works for you guys is you guys interact in the product market. You buy stuff from businesses, so they sell, you buy. That's it. Cool. All right. Oh, God, don't want to scroll too fast on that. I think that's good on questions, comments, concerns about the circular flow model. But if you have more, throw them in there. I'll see them at some point, and I'll address them at least at the end of the video. At least at the end of the live stream, I'll mention them. Okay. This next slide, disclaimer, don't write these down. <laughs> There's too much stuff here. I don't want you to write all this down. None of this is highlighted. This is all just things to be aware of as like rules for econ in general. So I don't need you to write any of this. This is just stuff that classifies as rules under economics. So let's go through them briefly. The first two are what we did on Thursday, because I keep forgetting which class, I, which day I taught you guys. Thursday, which is we want a bunch of stuff, but everything is limited. That's the idea of scarcity, right? So the definition of economics is the study of the choices that we make due to scarcity, right? So there is scarcity is rule number one. Rule number two, because of scarcity, we got to choose. And every time we choose, there's a cost. We're always giving something up. It's always some kind of trade-off when it comes to making a choice. Those first two, so those first two things we've already basically covered. The next three are more pertinent to today. Three, everyone's goal is to maximize their satisfaction. Everyone acts in their own self-interest. That is something that is in the real world not true. In the real world, we know that some people act selflessly sometimes. Okay. okay. Some of you guys mentioned that you were going to text your buddy who might not have been here in the class. That's acting out of your own self-interest because frankly, you guys would benefit class rank wise if your buddy misses some classes and doesn't do as well. That could benefit you. It sucks, but you were being good. You guys were being good dudes. So that's the right, that's, that's cool. That's not how we think in econ. Okay, in econ, we assume people's gonna act in their own self-interest because it's way harder to gauge everyone's selflessness than it is to just assume everyone is selfish and work from there. Okay, it is easier for us to assume that everyone is selfish and just go off of that assumption. In the course, we are well not true. In the course is what we do. Rule four is the focus for the remainder of what we're talking about today. Rule four is we always make choices by comparing marginal benefit and marginal cost. Okay, if the benefits exceed the cost, we'll do the thing. If the cost exceeds the benefit, we won't. It's how we choose. Economics is a study of choices. How do we figure out how people choose? They act in their own self-interest, they weigh the cost and the benefit. And number five we've already mentioned today, which was with the circular flow model, real life can be explained and analyzed through simplified models and graphs. That part we've already been through. So do not write these down, these are just rules to understand for the course. 
and how economics is going to work. So, if, so basically, this is to tackle if you have a question like, but what about if one of these answers it? It tends to cover that. All right, this is a lot of text. Let me walk us through all of this stuff. This takes a little bit to explain, too. So, how do we choose? Most important thing in economics, in terms of functional, based on the definition, is how do we choose? And this is keeping in mind assumptions three and four, self-interest and cost and benefit. If we all behave rationally according to our self-interest, the choice that we will make is one in which, and this is the definition of rational choice, where marginal benefit exceeds or equals marginal cost. If the benefit exceeds or equals the cost, we'll do it. Exceeds because obviously if there's more benefit than cost, you do it. Equals because then it's an equal trade, which would be worth it generally. And if cost exceeds benefit, then you wouldn't do the thing, right? It wasn't worth it for you. That can you scoot a little bit? Can you scoot that way a little bit? Like, my little brother is here. Uh, marginal cost and marginal benefit, what those terms mean in case you get stuck on it. The word marginal people tend to get thrown off by it. It just means like per unit. Marginal just means for every one of this, how much of X gets changed. So the marginal cost is the cost of a one unit in an increase in an activity. So for every extra hour you study, what are you giving up? It doesn't have to be money. It can be like time. Like if it's, if it's studying for a test, it's probably time. It could also be like sleep, right? For every extra hour of studying I do, I'm getting one less hour of sleep. For every extra hour of studying I'm doing, I have one less hour to work if you're going to work, okay? Or for every extra hour of study of this class, I am losing time I could have studied for other classes. So that's what the marginal cost is, right? So what you're giving up. That part's not confusing. Marginal benefit is the gain of that activity. It doesn't have to be tangible, but it can be. Uh, so for that example of for every extra hour you're studying, how much is your grade changing by for the better? Forever. If you knew going into studying that for every extra hour I study, I will score seven points higher on the test. If you knew that going in, I'm sure a lot of you would be able to be like, oh, I'll probably study then because there's a tangible nature to it. So if it's tangible, that's great. It's not always tangible. Like with studying, it's just that you'll do better on the test is the marginal benefit. Okay, you don't know how much you're going to gain from it, but you know you're going to gain. It could also be savings. I'll get into that. On the next slide that is a little tricky but there is one final rule when it comes to marginal benefit and this is different than marginal cost this is a separate thing if you want I probably could have highlighted that to be honest which is as you consume more of something the benefit for it decreases the more you do of a thing the less you get out of it each time which makes sense because if you think of the studying example like if you study for I mean, God help you eight hours which I mean I did college midterms before so that does happen if you did study for eight hours, chances are what you get done in the eighth hour isn't nearly as beneficial as what you got done in the first hour. It's why you stop studying, right? It's at some point the cost exceeds the benefit. At some point you're not getting that much out of each extra hour of studying. You'd rather sleep. You'd rather do whatever the hell else you're going to do, right? So as you consume more of a product, the benefit starts to deteriorate over time. It gets less and less. I also refer to this as the uh, 20 piece McNugget rule where the first nugget you eat is pretty good because you're hungry and desperate this is McDonald's but by the time you get to like the 20th nugget you're like looking at it and you're like this is chicken paste I think I see like an eyeball in here or whatever you're getting less and less out of it the more and more you eat right that's the idea for marginal benefit now if you ever get stuck or confused on how these work the easiest way I can tell to describe these is that they're incentives. That marginal cost is the penalty for, a v, for an action. Marginal benefit is the reward. If a scenario is increasing or decreasing the reward for something, it's changing the marginal benefit. If a scenario is increasing or decreasing the penalty for something, that's changing the marginal cost. Examples of that would be like, some teachers don't give you any extra credit points for like doing a review for a test, right? I give you five points for doing that. By giving you five points for doing the review for the test, I have increased the marginal benefit. I've made it more beneficial for you to do the test. I didn't decrease the cost, right? The cost is the same. The cost is how much time it takes to do the review. That hasn't changed, but the benefit is higher now, right? 
So I changed the reward. The reward is better. If I change the penalty, say, instead of cheating on a test giving you like that temporary zero, you retake it, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, NISD's stupid policy with cheating when it's very little of a punishment. If instead of that penalty, I made it so that you get dropped from the course and I call your college, to let them know that you did that on an AP class to warn them about admitting you. I've significantly jacked up the penalty, which means the marginal cost is way higher. The reason why you're doing that is because you want to satisfy this equation. If I make the cost exceed the benefit, you won't cheat. So if I jack up the penalty for something, you're less likely to do it. It's the Singapore example, right? I mentioned Singapore, one of the safest places to live in the world. Why? The marginal cost of committing any crime is insanely high. The benefit's the same, right? The benefit of committing those crimes is the same as it would be in most places. But the cost is crazy high. So you don't do stuff. Cool. So reward, benefit, penalty, cost. There you go. Now, this is the saving thing. No, oh, move my face out of the way. This is the savings example that I was mentioning, where marginal benefit can mean an actual thing you physically gain. It could also be like savings. And here is the scenario where it would be like savings. So look at the table. Let me explain what's happening here. This is, I know this scenario isn't like the most realistic because a lot of you guys would never see a movie more than once. I get that. But think of like the best movie experience you had in your entire life. Maybe it was like the like end game. I don't know. Whatever. A movie that you were crazy hyped to see and it satisfied everything you wanted and you wanted to see it again because it was that awesome. It doesn't happen a lot now, but let's say it did happen. This is a scenario in which the benefit, meaning how much the person would be willing to spend to see the movie, is $30 for the first time, 15 the second time, 5 the third time. The cost is the cost of the ticket. It's $10 every time. So let me explain that again. Benefit here means how much you'd be willing to give up to see the movie. You don't always put a number on it, but it does exist in your head. Think about it. If you walked into the movie theater to go see a movie, and the person at the ticket counter said, okay, that'll be twenty-two fifty for your ticket, would you be like, okay? Or would you be like, no? Okay. If you said, no, I wouldn't do that, cool. In that case, you have a lower bar than this. Okay. In that case... That's, that's one of the times where marginal cost is exceeding the benefit. Okay, the cost is exceeding the benefit to you. For this person, in this example, they would have been willing to see, spend 30 bucks to see this movie. Say it's Endgame, at midnight, at the theater. You get to the ticket clerk, they say it's 30 bucks, you're like, you know what, screw it, fine. Here's 30 bucks, I'll pay it, because I want to see this movie really badly. Cool. If you go to the clerk and they say it's $10, and you're willing to spend 30, how do you feel? Pretty good. Think of any time you ever buy anything on sale ever. If you've ever gone to a store to buy a thing and found out that it was on sale. Or you went to a store and saw something you liked and saw the price, you're like, ugh. And then found it was on sale, you're like, oh, yes. Because you were willing to spend X number and now the cost is lower than what you were willing to spend. So you're saving money, right? So the idea here is would you see this movie three times? This is choice, right? Would you see it three times? You definitely see it the first time, right? Benefit is 30, it only costs 10, of course I would see this movie. You'd also see it the second time, right? If I'd be willing to spend 15 and it only costs 10, I would also see the movie. That's still a good deal for me. I know you don't always see a movie two times in the theater, I've done it only a couple of times to do that, but hey, I would have seen it a second time if it was $15, it only cost 10, I'd absolutely see it. Would they see it the third time? No. They'd only have been willing to see it if it was $5. It's still 10, they ain't gonna do it. The total does not matter. This is to mislead you. And that's how the AP exam stuff can kind of get you with this, where you're like, but in total, the benefit exceeds the cost. It's like, yeah, but marginal means each individual choice. Remember, marginal benefit and marginal cost are the benefit and cost for one action, for a one unit increase, for each time seeing the movie. It's not all or nothing. The world doesn't work like that. It's each individual choice. So this person would see the movie twice. They'd see it the first time, they'd see it the second time, they would not see it the third time because the benefit is less than the cost. They're getting less out of it than, they would, than they're being asked to spend. So that's what I mean by it could be savings instead of gains. This person isn't getting paid 20 bucks to go see the movie. They just saved in their head 20 bucks. That is tricky, but it's the way of thinking like, okay, benefit is to exceed cost. Okay, almost done. Yeah, you should, you'll probably end with 15 minutes to spare, I think, here.
Thank you guys for your patience today. I really do appreciate it. I know this is taking a while. A lot of it's just making sure that everything runs smoothly on a live stream. It normally wouldn't. It would have, this would have taken probably 50 minutes in normal class. Okay, opportunity cost. Let me move my face because this is a lot of text too. So outside of the marginal benefit, marginal cost, where it's like literally a tangible number or like a numbers thing that you can usually apply to it. Whenever you choose to do something, there's also an additional underlying cost that you typically don't think about, and that is called the opportunity cost. What that is, and I'll put a couple of definitions down, is the next best thing you had to give up in order to do or get something. It could also be thought of as the benefit you would have gone if you had chosen your second option. Like, what do you mean? Let's, let's play this example out. Um, a lot of you guys are, deter are trying to pick between colleges that you would like to go to. Some of you might even have an official list that you're picking from. You got like a top five or a top 10. For me, when I was in high school, I had three. There were three schools that I was really thinking about. There were more that I could have, but there were really three that I had narrowed down my options to by like December of senior year. Those were UNT, Baylor, and UT Austin. Those were my three. And they were in that order in my head. UNT, Baylor, UT Austin. UNT, not because I like the school the most, but because um, I saw it as like the best option because it'd be low cost, really easy to do, um, like convenience wise, not like an easier school to graduate from, but like just convenient. Um, I had a lot of options there. It had a great music program because I was doing music at the time. I was a band kid. So that was my number one option. And I, could get pro I was probably gonna get scholarships to go to UNT. Baylor was second because the music program is very good there. UT was third because I knew I was probably not going to get any scholarships from them because it's UT and the music program there is good, but it's not as good as the top two. Those were my three. When I chose to go to UNT, eventually, I didn't just give up the money that it was going to cost me to go to UNT, right? I also gave up what I would have gotten by going to Baylor instead, which is whatever the experience or connections I would have gotten from Baylor. That is the opportunity cost. It is whatever you gave up by not picking your second option, specifically your second option. Because realistically, in that example, if I didn't go to UNT, where would I go? Baylor. Not UT, Baylor. So the third option doesn't really matter. It's just the second option. Other examples would be like uh, going out for dinner versus staying in. If there's only two choices, it's really easy. If you choose to go out for dinner, what's the opportunity cost if you had stayed in? Right? What you would have gotten from staying in. That could have been a healthier meal. It could have been saving money. It could have been a lot of things. Opportunity cost could be a lot of stuff. Studying versus chess versus going to like a football game on, on a Thursday. So we have a Thursday football game, right? We used to, we had those all the time. The Thursday football game, test on Friday. Happens. Some teachers are mean, right? You go to the sporting event, the opportunity cost is probably studying for the test. Although, if you weren't going to do that, then that's not your opportunity cost. It's whatever your second option was, whatever your preference second option was. So if you're either going to the football game or going to stay home and play video games for 12 hours, the opportunity cost is whatever you get for playing, from playing video games for 12 hours. Going to college, earning the workforce, blah, 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 blah. Basic idea, every time you make a choice, it's not just costing you whatever it costs in that choice, it's costing you your next option as well, whatever you would have gotten from your second option. I'm gonna give you one more practical example of how this works with one tricky thing, people can mess up with it, and then we're done for today. So we're almost there, guys. So here is our practical example. Let me pick someone from the chat. Um, I'm going to use Lily because Lily got the trivia right. <laughs> All right, so Lily, and I apologize if you don't like either of these places or if you're vegetarian, this is not going to be an amazing example for us to use, but play, play along with it. Let's say Lily has money to go to Whataburger or Wendy's, but those are the two restaurants she's picking between. Again, probably picking from different restaurants, just giving you two. Okay, got money for Whataburger, got money for Wendy's. These are the two we're picking from. What is the opportunity cost if Lily decides to go to Whataburger? Well, if she's picked between those two places, then the opportunity cost is whatever she would have gotten out of going to Wendy's, right? Whatever benefit she would have gained by going to Wendy's, she gave up on that by going to Whataburger because that was her second choice. Options were Whataburger, Wendy's, picks what a opportunity cost is Wendy's. It's the path that wasn't taken, right? It's the fork in the road and it's the other path. If she had instead chosen Wendy's, the opportunity cost would have been Whataburger, right? Same idea. It's the thing that she didn't do. It's the other option. It's really easy when there's just two choices to figure out the opportunity cost. It is harder 
when there are more. So let's broaden out the spectrum. When to use this Lily's example? Cool. So if opportunity cost would have been Whataburger in that example. But here's the bigger thing. Here's the, here's the, here's the wild part. If we add an everywhere in this area, control the club, Roanoke, even north, like as far as the speedway, because there's like an in and out over here and a wing stop. There's, you know, we add more options when we do that. Every fast food restaurant in the greater Trotha Club, Roanoke, North Lake, that whole area. Okay, all of those. It's within like 10 minutes of the school. Okay. If she picks Wendy's again, what is her opportunity cost? Now, pause. And I'm using, I'm using actually Lily here, not this fictional version of Lily that's picking between these two places. I'm using actually Lily. She chooses Wendy's. What is her opportunity cost? And this is the tricky part. Do we know her preferences? She has not said them. She just said that she likes Wendy's. We do not know Lily's preferences. Lily knows Lily's preferences, but we, the collective, the class, myself, I don't know what Lily likes, right? Therefore, I don't know what the opportunity cost is of that decision. And that's the actual answer. That's what you write on the AP exam is, if they give you, this person has 10 options of a place to go and they pick this one and there's no like ranking, there's no priority given to any of them, you don't know what the opportunity cost is because it is specifically, let me go back to that slide, the benefit you could have had if you chose your second option, the highest valued alternative given up, it is the other option. It has to be the other option. We don't know what her other option is. Her other option isn't every other restaurant because if you phrase it like that, what you're telling the AP exam is if Lily didn't go to Wendy's, she would instead go to every single fast food restaurant in Trophy Club, Roanoke, Northlake. All of them. Not any of them. All of them. I don't think Lily's going to do that, especially if money, that's what it seems to be, is a big motivating factor for why she would go to Wendy's because the four for four slash five for five is an amazing deal and Whataburger is pricier. That is a fair criticism of Whataburger. I think it tastes better, but it is pricier. She's not going to go to every other fast food restaurant. She's going to go to her second option. And unless we find out what Lily's preference is, which Lily, feel free to tell me what your second option would be out of every restaurant in the greater Trotha Club Roanoke area. You can feel free to type that in the chat when you get that as part of the video. Um, if we don't know what our second option is, then we can't possibly say what the opportunity cost is. Now, once you know preferences, then you can. If we, if we got like Lily's like top 10, if we got Lily's like top 10 list of her favorite restaurants in this area, and she picks number one, easy, opportunity cost number two, done. That's it. You have to know preferences to know opportunity cost. And again, that is on this slide, in the notes tab. Chick-fil-A. No, that's fine. Really, that's perfectly fine. Chick-fil-A is good. She picks Wendy's. Her opportunity cost is now Chick-fil-A. Now we know that. Done. Problem solved. But if they never reveal her preferences, we do not know the opportunity cost. They have to tell you what the preferences are. Otherwise, the answer is, I don't know. That's actually the correct answer. The correct answer is we can't know based on current information. Oh my God, Austin. Austin was in my class last year and graduated high school, and he's coming back to watch a high school economics class. What a nerd, Austin! Hope college is going well for you, buddy. That is it for today. I'm not going to make you guys do the partner thing because the partner thing doesn't need to have ha doesn't need to happen. I don't want to take up any more of your time. That took a while. Okay. So if you have any questions in the chat, feel free to publish them. Uh, Brendan, I know you emailed me. I think I fixed the thing. Uh, what you're gaining by choosing your first option over the second? No, it's what you give up. Jordan, the opportunity cost is what you would have gotten if you chose your second option. You don't end up getting your opportunity cost. Your opportunity cost is something that you give up. It is a loss. It's just specifically the loss that you incur by not picking number two. Which you would have gained had you picked number two because you gave that up as well. It's a good question, Jordan. It is confusing. It's a lot of words. So if you have questions like that, feel free. Yeah, any questions you might have about the class, anything like that, go for it. Let me know. Anything at all. Okay. Otherwise, we are good for today. Okay, you are free to head out. You do not have to hang around. Um, Zoom should be working again. 
at least at the very least by Wednesday when I have you guys again. And I will email out the link again, but try to enroll into my my Moodle. If you're enrolled in my Moodle, then you're good because the Zoom link for fifth peer there is this is the right link. That is the correct link to get into it. So you don't have to look on your email for a Zoom link. If you're in my Moodle class, just go to Moodle and go to that. Okay. I'll probably keep sending out that email just in case. Chris, I do not have moderators, but I'm not giving anyone any of my students moderating tools. That ain't happening. I follow enough Twitch profiles to know that mods can go out of control sometimes. So I'm not going to give any of you power over your friends. Let's go to default bigger game. Okay, so any questions, comments, concerns about the stuff that we've done today, about course so far, class so far, anything like that? Any things that we are worried about? Austin, it is good to see you. So happens when you follow my YouTube channel. Oh yeah, uh, if you if I would probably subscribe to this channel if I'm any of you, just in case we have to do this again. In case you know, Zoom has a bad day. Uh, this is my backup plan, and I'll be using this for um, you know, reviewing material and stuff like that. If there's like a test on a particular day and I want to record a quick little review video, I'll probably put it on here. So, not a bad idea to subscribe to this channel. Uh, I do not care about like trying to get subs for the sake of making money. That is never going to happen with this channel. I cannot have this channel monetized. It's educational. So, that ain't going to happen. But, feel free to subscribe to it. It'll be helpful, especially if we have to do these with any type of frequency. I don't know if we'll have to, but if the district gives me okay on it, for attendance purposes, I might use it. But I prefer Zoom because I like being able to see your guys' faces. It helps me know who you are. Because I don't know what, like, 98% of you look like from a association standpoint. Like, that is them. That is them. Don't know it yet. It's, we're still too early. So It was easier last semester because I knew all my kids at that point. You guys, I don't know you yet. No, I don't really know you yet. You got 15 minutes until next class period. Do not use sub bots, please, God. Don't do anything weird to this channel, guys. <laughs> Please. I had to jump through a lot of hoops to even let for the school to even be cool with me doing a live stream for my class. Don't make it harder on it. Don't make me only be able to use Zoom. That isn't better for you. That's worse. Trust me. Okay. Yeah. If 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 you don't have any more questions, feel free to you get your good to log off. I'm going to close this stream once we're good with questions and then restart it up for seventh period for them. If you're an early release person, uh, I don't think you need to hang around for me doing the exact same lecture again, unless you really, really want to, but that seems like a bad use of your time. <laughs> that seems like a really not good use of your time, so I wouldn't do that. But thank you, everybody. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. Uh, go crush it in the 2K demo because I gotta play that at like 5 o'clock today. I'm gonna see how that goes because I freaking love 2K. So I'm hyped for it. I'll give it another minute because of the delay between questions and me seeing them. But yeah, you're all good to go. see any more questions uh i will end the stream here thank you all very much for joining in i mean we had an overwhelming majority of the class in this so thank you guys so much for participating it was great having you guys here